Welcome to Curax 2021 virt Virtual Assembly, hosted by the McGill University Retiree Association, MURA, in celebration of McGill's bicentennial. My name is Ginette Lamontagne, president of MURA, and I'm very proud to be your host today. McGill University is located on land which has long served as the site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous people, including the nations of Haudenosaunee and Ashinaabe. McGill Honors recognizes and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we meet today. Welcome to Montreal. While we wish you were all here in person, at least we are able to rise to the occasion and connect with people from virtually everywhere. It is my pleasure to welcome not only NURA members, but as well, CURAC colleagues from the College and University Retiree Associations of Canada and from AROI, the, As the Association of Retirement Organizations of Higher Education from all over the United States. Je souhaite aussi la bienvenue aux collègues des universités du Québec, des universités francophones du Canada et aux amis de la francophonie canadienne. We have a great program for you today. Let's make the best of the next 90 minutes we will spend virtually together. To help ensure the success of this virtual event, I would like to introduce Kate McGuire, our Vice President Internal, who will briefly talk about a few technical aspects of this webinar. Kate. Thank you, Jeanette. As this is a webinar, I would like to remind you of a few things. Number one, your audio and video will be turned off as well as the chat feature during this session. By default, the presentation will be heard in English. For simultaneous French translation, tap the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen to select French or English. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to send us your questions. Finally, please be advised that this webinar is being recorded and will appear on a website after it has been processed. Thank you. Back to you, Jeanette. And I will begin right away by introducing Brian Harvey, President of Curac, to give the opening remarks. Brian Harvey is an Emeritus Professor from the University of Saskatchewan, College of Agriculture and Bioresources, internationally recognized scholar, teacher, administrator, and public servant. A scholar of over 150 scientific and technical publications and breeder or co-breeder of over 60 varieties of barley. He received many honors, including the Order of Canada and the Saskatchewan Order of Merit. Ryan. Thank you, Jeanette. Bonjour tout le monde. That's the extent of my French, I'm afraid. On behalf of the College and University Retirees Association of Canada, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this groundbreaking virtual assembly. As you're all aware, we've had to forego our in-person annual conference in 2020 and again in 2021, due of course to COVID-19. These are wonderful opportunities to get together with colleagues from across the country. We all miss the great interactions which they provide. We're delighted therefore that Mura has stepped up to organize this event. Only a year ago, most of us had never heard of the technology which makes this possible. Now we're experienced veterans. I want to acknowledge the tremendous effort that has gone into organizing it and to extend our thanks to Jeanette and her team for a job well done. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the contributions of Jeanette Lamontagne, not only for the leadership role she has played in organizing this assembly, but also for her work that she has done as a retiree association president who has worked diligently with CURAC to facilitate its work. She has also been particularly effective in engaging the Francophone Quebec universities. We all owe her a debt of gratitude as she steps down from her position as inaugural president of MURA. I'm sure that we can count on her involvement in the future. 
Merci, Jeanette. I would be remiss if I did not also thank our sponsors, always an essential part of a successful conference. Our sponsors are Colette Travel Tours, Economical Insurance for Car, Home and Pets, Johnson Travel Insurance, Retired Teachers of Ontario Extended Health Benefits Plan, and Trip Merchants Discounted Travel. Please visit the CURAC website for more complete information on the offerings of these sponsors. One of the advantages of this technology is that one can connect from anywhere on the globe as long as one has access to the internet. Thus, not only have we been able to invite CURAC uh, members from across Canada, but also the Quebec University Retirees Association and AROHI, our counterpart in the United States of America. A special welcome to you. CURAC and AROHI both got their start 20 years ago and we have initiated discussions to see if there's something we can do jointly to celebrate our 25th anniversary. So stay tuned for developments. I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate McGill University on its 200th anniversary. This is a significant milestone for one of Canada's premier universities. Its contributions to this country have been enormous and I'm sure that they will continue in the future. I'm a geneticist, so I am particularly looking forward to today's feature presentation. Epigenetics is probably the least well-known aspect of genetics and has not been without its controversial aspects, but it is proving to be much more important than we once thought it to be. We are fortunate indeed to have a foremost expert in Professor Ziff to speak to us today, and I look forward very much to his presentation. Again, welcome everybody, bienvenue tout le monde. Back to you, Jeanette. Thank you, Brian, for your kind words. It is, it is an honor for me to introduce Principal Suzanne Fortier, serving as McGill Principal since 2013. Formerly president of the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada, NSERC, VP Academic, VP Science, and also Professor of Chemistry of Queen's University, currently chair of the Global University Leaders of the World Economic Forum. Dr. Fortier's association with the university began way before her tenure as principal, as she earned her BSc and PhD from Miguel. Today, Principal Fortier will speak on Rising to the Challenge, Reflections on Miguel's Third Century. Principal Fortier. Merci, Ginette. Et bonjour et bienvenue à vous tous. How much of a pleasure it is for us to welcome you, all of you, at Miguel today for this meeting. Very important meeting. All of you from across our country and also from the U.S. So thank you for being with us today. It's really a great honor for me to be among you, people who have devoted your talent to the higher education sector. Uh, as you know, both of our country enjoy a very great achievement in the higher education sector. And I think you can all take credit for what we've built both here in Canada and in the U.S. Uh, I want to also extend very special thanks to Ginette Lamontagne. Uh, you may know that she dedicated 35 years of her time here at McGill, 35 great years at McGill. And then uh, when she was supposed to be retiring, uh, I think she took another job, which is as a founder and creator of the association at McGill, uh, the McGill University Retiree Association and has uh, developed this association from the ground up, uh, starting many new initiatives, uh, very engaging initiatives and bringing our community together uh, past the, the time of service at the university. So un grand, grand merci à vous, Ginette. Je pense que tous les gens vont se joindre à moi pour uh, vous féliciter et vous remercier pour tout ce que vous avez fait ici à McGill et uh, à l'échelle aussi nationale. Alors, Thank you very much to Jeanette. 
So I want to thank you also for extending good wishes to us on the occasion of our 200th anniversary. It is a very special moment. As you know, the official date was March 31st, and we had a celebration on that day, but we'll continue the celebration through the year. Now, of course, we all know what happens at these milestone anniversary. One of the things we normally do is look behind, look at the past, and celebrate people. I think for me, uh, when I think of McGill, I think of the people. I think of the people who have built and shaped our university over 200 years and made it what it is today. But we also look to the future. That's, uh, I think, equally important. Look to the future and ask ourselves, what is it that I want to do next? And here at McGill, we're thinking about what do we want to do in our third century? What is the kind of university we want to be in our third century? And I would say to you that there are three uh, themes, three priorities that are really uh, front and center in our thinking. The first one is creating opportunities that open doors. We have so many people who came to our university, and I know it's true in many of your universities, who say, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for the chance that McGill gave me, uh, the support they gave me. And that is so important to us, accessibility to people who have dreams, have ambitions. Sometimes they don't have the financial means, but we need to be there for those people and create those opportunities for them and have the confidence in them because that is so much part of success for us as individuals is having people who believe in us and have confidence. A second very important theme for us is preparing our students for the future. Uh, there's one thing we know, and that is we can't predict the future very well. I think the pandemic has shown us there that very clearly, but uh, there will be all sorts of opportunities and challenges in the future. We don't, uh, we're not able to anticipate them all, but what we know is that they will require uh, human uh, creativity, ingenuity, uh, people who are prepared to work hard. And so we need to prepare our students for that. Of course, a very important theme is research and the research that will change people's lives. Many people had no clue that the work done decades ago on mRNA was gonna be so essential right now for keeping us safe. But it is important that we continue that journey and the exploration of knowledge and be brave and courageous as we do so, go beyond the frontiers that we know now. And I know with Professor Schiff, we'll have a good taste of that because this work is really uh, one that is a pioneer work. And of course, bringing uh, our research innovations ideas, bringing the innovation that drive progress in our society. So, you know, over the last, uh, I would say four, five, six months, the phrase I've heard most often from people and because of the pandemic is building back better. We need to build back better. People are realizing that the goal is not to return to the new, to the normal, uh, the old normal, or even something that might be called a new normal. The normal wasn't all that great for many, many people. And so I think there's a sense across the world that we need to build back better. And I think that is part of why we believe that giving uh, our students these opportunities is so important because they will be the builders. They're the ones who will shape the future. So we need to be there for them and prepare them to build back better. And of course, with COVID, we know how important it is to do the fundamental research to advance knowledge and to bring our knowledge and ideas to society through innovation. I'll talk more specifically about our faculty of medicine because you know, it was the very first faculty created at McGill. It is 200 year old and the Montreal General Hospital was also created at the same time. So it was the pioneer faculty at McGill. And of course, they've been front and center with their work during the pandemic. Uh, they were there uh, with uh, the knowledge, the research, but also with many people giving of their time to serve our community here, providing the healthcare services that was needed here in our city. So they have been taking a very central part um, in, our, in this pandemic, but of course, uh, they've made great contributions to uh, keeping us healthy 
for a very long time in very important fields, such of course as cancer research, uh, the neuroscience, one of the big uh, area of research at McGill is the brain. Uh, of course, also in understanding infectious disease and immun immunity. In infectious disease, you probably have heard of the great work that was done here on AIDS. So uh, that was a very important uh, uh, field. Uh, many people were suffering and dying. And of course, more recently in COVID-19. The uh, one area that I would mention also that is uh, extremely important at McGill is genomics. And it is a field in which our keynote speaker today is a leader, Professor Moshe Schiff. Uh, he holds a James McGill professorship and also a GlaxoSmithKline CIHR chair in pharmacology. So these are great uh, honors uh, for Professor Schiff, but it doesn't stop there. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Health Science. He's a true pioneer in his field and he's credited with the discovery that our DNA is influenced by our social environment early in life, a breakthrough that launched a completely new field of social epigenetics. I'm uh, uh, old enough to remember the whole debate between nature and nurture. So I'm glad, Professor Schiff, that you jump into that debate and taught us uh, that it's not always a dichotomy out there. Uh, he has been uh, researching DNA methylation for the last three decades and has published over 300 papers in this field of DNA methylation. In 2016, he founded HKG Epitherapeutics, and this is a company that developed next generation epigenetic diagnostic tests for early detection of cancer and other diseases. So I'm very excited that he is our keynote speaker today. I've had the privilege of hearing him uh, before, and I was telling him that it made such an impression on me that I still remember many elements of your talk, and I can't wait to hear it, hear more and hear it now. So uh, without further ado, uh, please uh, join me in, in welcoming our distinguished keynote speaker, Professor Moshe Schiff, uh, who will share uh, his insights and the great research he's been doing. Merci. Thank you, uh, Principal, for uh... An inspiring introduction, message for the vision, and thank you for your nice words that you said about me. And for setting up the uh, question that I'm going to discuss with you uh, uh, this afternoon. Nature and nurture has been on our minds probably still since we were walking on this planet. What is more important, the biological matrix that we are born with or the stuff that happens to us during life, our parents, our environment, uh, our friends, our society. In modern terms, nature is genetics. It's the genes that we inherit from our ancestors, genes that evolved in uh, billions of years of evolution. How, determine, how determinant they are in defining our phenotype. Are they doing everything or leaving something for that ephemeral nurture? And if indeed nurture has any role, how does it play its role? Is it magic? Or are there real biochemical processes that mediate between the love and care of a mother and the way this baby will develop uh, later in life? The environment that this baby is going to grow in, physical, social, economic environment. And the answer to this centuries or millennia old questions became possible with the evolution of the field of epigenetics. For the last 50 years, we understood that we have the same DNA in every cell. So when we inherit the DNA from father and mother, the same identical DNA will be in the billions of cells that will make up our body. But we know that every part of our body does different things. So how can same DNA perform different programs in different cells and parts of the body. 
And this question was answered even before we understood how DNA works. And the person who actually addressed this question was Waddington in the United Kingdom. And he's the one who coined the term epigenetics. That is something beyond genetics must be happening uh, to DNA that allows it to perform all its different functions. And to simplify and use a metaphor, what does epigenetic mean? And I think we all use cell phones and computers. And we understand that any computer is composed of multiple parts. The most important part, of course, is the hardware. In our computer, it's the DNA itself, the chemistry of the DNA. It's the wires, the leads, the circuitries. On this hardware, we have an operating system. Could be Windows, could be Apple. And the sequence, the genetics, is our operating system. However, we also need software. Because like any good phone or computer, we have different apps. And if you think about our body, one app is a lung and another one is a heart and another one is a liver. So somebody has to write on the sequence on the operating system software. And we can think about epigenetics or DNA methylation, which is the aspect of epigenetics I will discuss in detail as the software. So we have computers in our body the same operating system everywhere, but different apps make cells perform specific tasks in space and time. The amazing thing about humans and other organisms is that, that our DNA doesn't just define how we look when we are born, it has to program our entire life. And so it has to perform specific tasks at specific places, but also at specific times. So if we understand the way our DNA works like this, then what is disease? Disease is caused by changes in the app that we could map and use, for example, for early detection. So it's just little chemistry, um, although I apologize for being uh, too uh, specific here, but it's so beautiful that I need to share it with everyone, even those of you who are not in chemistry or biochemistry. So one of the letters of our DNA is cytosine. We have four letters. This letter could be modified by proteins, specific proteins called enzymes, DNA methyltransferase, that take a methyl group from a dietary supplement called S-adenosylmethionine and position it on this position in DNA. And this creates an amazingly simple and complex at the same time way of programming DNA because this cytosine would allow gene to be an on and this marking will shut it down. So you have almost a binary system like the coder of a computer a software program. And you can decide which gene uh, is going to work and which is not going to work. So if we have 20,000 genes and multiple ways of um, starting those genes, we have an immense uh, complexity that one can create. And this is exactly what happens um, uh, during, um, uh, during uh, embryogenesis. In the last years, we'll learn that this gets even more sophisticated and more beautiful because this methyl group could be further modified by other enzymes that we call in chemistry, oxidize the methyl group to different level of oxidation. And again, adjust this signal to uh, multiple other signals. So on one cytosine, you can have multiple forms of way this gene is work. And now without knowing the details, you can understand how, you, how during embryogenesis an enormous level of plasticity is created. And we need to think about um, these systems as networks. So it's not which gene works and not, it's which groups, which networks of genes work together or not. Some are active, some are inactive. And when that network works, we get a heart and this network works, get, we, we get a lung and so on and so forth. These of course are processes that are deeply uh, determined by evolution and, and defined uh, in a very predictable way uh, how an organism like ourselves uh, develops. But now this has taught us one important lesson that leads us to addressing the question, how could nurture change nature? What we'll learn from epigenetics 
is that DNA doesn't need to be changed to perform numerous tasks. DNA methylation adds to DNA a cellular identity. If I take a piece of DNA today, I can map exactly the methylation sequence, and I know if it comes from a liver or a heart or even which neuron in the, in the, in the brain it comes from. This is kind of very stable, very fixed. However, it tells us that the same DNA could do different things. So perhaps ba a baby can inherit the same DNA like another baby, but if that DNA is modified differently, not just by embryogenesis, but by experience. So perhaps DNA has an experiential identity. Perhaps there is a way by which environment can talk to DNA and, and methylate it in a different way, change the chromatin in a different way, and thus change the phenotype. And really the breakthrough came from a meeting that I had with another great scientist at McGill, uh, Michael Meany. And Michael Meany spent his life in an understanding uh, impact uh, of early life on how humans and animals develop. And he used this beautiful model where you see a rat uh, taking care of her pups. And the licking and grooming uh, of the pups uh, define how these pups will develop. Some rats do a lot, some do very little. Most of them do something in between. And when Michael and his team separated these rats and followed them until they became adults long after their mother was dead, he found that there are big differences between the rats that received a lot of care and those that received little care and how they develop their stress responses. So the, the rats that had a low licking and grooming mother low maternal care, developed a very stressed stress response, very heightened stress response, whereas the animals that had high licking and grooming developed a very tampered uh, stress response. So Michael did another experiment, which was very critical to tease apart whether these changes are caused by nurture, the way the mother um, treats the, uh, the pups, or by nature. And, and the way they did that is by an experiment cross, called cross-fostering. So you can get the pup, pup from a low mother or a high mother and split it to two mothers. One is a high and one is low. And ask the question, who will define this stressed phenotype? Is it the biological mother or is it the adoptive mother? And the amazing answer was that it was the adoptive mother not the biological mother. It was the nurturing mother that defined the phenotype. And that raised, of course, the question, how is it possible? As scientists, we don't believe in magic. Uh, we try to find scientific explanations uh, to this uh, phenomenon. And we met each other uh, in a bar in Madrid on days where you met people not on Zoom, but drinking beer together. And uh, we discussed this. And at the same time, I was deeply involved in understanding how DNA methylation is changing in cancer. And this meeting of minds created a partnership to start and examine whether the same processes that define how different cells can have the same DNA and do different things is also involved, how people with different experiences will eventually do uh, have a different phenotypes. And in a work that took a decade, uh, we started charting a pathway from the behavior of the mother down to the DNA itself that ends up in differential marking of the DNA without changing the sequence. So there's when the animal, when when the animal or human mother uh, uh, takes care of the pups, there is pathways induced in the brain, like the serotonergic pathway, which in the hippocampus plays a very important role in guiding the gene, for example, of glucocorticoid receptor, uh, which will eventually control the stress response in the animal. So as the animal grooms the uh, pup, the DNA is also groomed through this signaling pathway, sending proteins to DNA that alter the way DNA is modified. So we found a proof of principle, how a grooming of a mother, which sounds like very ephemeral, can end up 
in very clear chemical marks on DNA at very particular addresses in the genome. But what makes this uniquely different and extremely optimistic and different from genetics, you know, when you inherit a bad gene, it's very, very difficult to do anything about it. But this is an enzymatic reaction. We as pharmacologists know that we can tilt them to one or other side. So we actually tested that. Could we change the phenotype of an animal from a low animal to a high animal by treating it with a epigenetic drug that activates genes? Uh, or could we reverse it the other way by an epigenetic drug? Um, this is actually amino acid that activates the methylation pathway uh, to methylate and silence gene. And indeed, it is possible. So here we have all the principles of epigenetics. It could be modulated by environment. There are pathways leading uh, from the behavior to the gene. Even though it's extremely stable, this methyl connection to DNA is the most stable bond in nature. Nevertheless, it's reversible and offering op opportunities both for prediction uh, and for a treatment. We were wondering if the same happens in humans. Humans are much more difficult to address. When I was a graduate student, I was told never to research humans because they are too complicated. And what complicates this kind of research in human is teasing apart genetics from epigenetics. People might have different maternal care, not because of epigenetics, but because they have, mothers have different genes that they inherited from their ancestors. So how do you tease it apart? And you can't do experiments uh, on humans, you know, like you do uh, on, on, uh, on rats. And so we took advantage of another great um, a study that was, was done in, in, in Montreal by a colleague of mine, Suzanne King at the Douglas Institute. We all remember the Quebec ice storm of 1998 and the devastation it wreaked on our province. But just think about being a pregnant mother during that time and the kind of stressors that you uh, were exposed to. And is that's exactly what Suzanne King uh, was thinking about when, when the storm hit. And she started uh, following up mothers who were is subjected to different levels of stress during the ice storm. She cataloged this, uh, created a classifier, which she called Storm 32. And now we had a, almost a random quasi-experimental situation in humans where different stress in childhood happened. And she followed these children as they grew. And they were, they, she discovered many genetic, dif many uh, phenotypic differences between the children. For example, different levels of sugar tolerance, Metabolism was altered, um, higher rates of asthma and autism. So both the immune system seems to be reacting, the metabolic system and the, uh, the neural system. So we wanted to map DNA methylation when these, in these kids when they were 14 years old. And uh, we looked at the immune system because of course these were living and uh, healthy kids. Um, and so blood was the only available source. And we wanted to ask, can we see at 15 years, 14, 15 years, the impact of the stress of the mother? What we see here is the level of stress of the mother, the objective stress as Suzanne King has classified. Each column here is a different adolescent. And the color that you see here, each line here is a different gene. Red genes are methylated and you see as the stress of the mother goes high, these genes become less methylated in green. These green genes become red as the stress goes high. What you see here again, it's not one or two genes that are changing, it's an entire network. It's not necessarily changing one way, but they're changing in multiple different way. I think about the genome as a corporation. So when a corporation decides to change strategy, it's not like one official who's going to change what they're doing, many, many officials will change what they're doing. Many divisions will change. And this is exactly what happened. When the stress increases, the body recognizes, I need to prepare myself to a different kind of world. And the whole genome is kind of uh, marking itself in a different way. But we can also develop what we call polygenic score, DNA methylation scores, not just one gene, but we can look at multiple genes methylation and see if they can predict or tell us something about the stress of the mother. And indeed, when we looked at it, the methylation in the children can be a, uh, informative on the level of stress uh, that the mother had during pregnancy. We believe that markers like this eventually will be very useful tools in the field of psychiatry by offering 
uh, objective measurements uh, of early life uh, stress. So essentially, uh, we think about disease as a change in the epigenetic software that programs the cell. Because um, if, if the normal situation is like this, there are met methylation epigenetic changes, is now different genes are on and off uh, causing disease. And the question is, if we can program genes, can we deprogram them? And I showed you that in the case of maternal care, we could do this. But can we use it for more medical uh, conditions, important medical conditions? And one example I'll give you is cocaine addiction, which is a horrible situation that creates a stable phenotype of craving and addiction that is highly morbid and, and devastating to the individual and to society. And I'll bring you this as just one example of how we think about epigenetics in the context uh, of treatment and intervention. So the question we asked was perhaps what happens in the addicted people as this normal state of epigenetics is changed by the experience of being exposed to a drug and creating an addicted state uh, of expression. Can we reverse it by using uh, epigenetic drugs back to normal? The attraction in epigenetic approaches is that we are kind of solving the underlying changes. We're not dealing with symptoms of addiction. We're dealing with a fundamental genomic change that is driving it. And if we can reverse it, we should be able to kind of cure the person, not just treat him, uh, him or her symptomatically. So we kind of explore that uh, possibility. The other thing we learn from epigenetics that behavioral intervention might be as important as chemical intervention, because the maternal care was a behavioral intervention, but it actually changed the chemistry uh, of, of the DNA. So theoretically, there shouldn't be a difference between a good behavioral intervention or a good therapeutic intervention or a good nutritional intervention. They all actually are hitting pathways that can lead to epigenetic reprogramming. So a friend of mine, a colleague of mine in Israel at the University of Ramat Gan, a bar Ilan in Ramat Gan, has been developing this model where a rat is learning how to self-administer cocaine. She actually connects it with a cue, very similar to humans. We usually will connect uh, certain uh, pleasurable ex experiences with, with another experience that they experienced while they did that. And these rats learn how to um, how to self-administer and rats enjoy it. So uh, not only humans, but also rats enjoy cocaine. And after a while, we put this rat in a rehab facility. We put it, the rat in a cage without cocaine for a month, which is a long time in a rat's life. During this time, the rat can think about cocaine, but never sees cocaine and, and leads a normal life. And after a month, the rat is exposed to this light, which reminds evokes in the, in the rats the memory of the great party where it received the cocaine. And it starts pressing the lever. And what's amazing is that after rehab, these rats become much more addicted than they were after the first exposure to cocaine. So we asked several questions. We found that big epigenetic changes occur in the brain of the rat during the rehab period, and also a big epigenetic changes occur when the cure is exposed. Now we ask the question, could we treat this rat with an epigenetic drug? This is a DNA methylation inhibitor at day 30, just as it comes out of rehab, when we stimulate the rat to uh, take uh, cocaine by the light, we treat it with this inhibitor. And what we found that it dramatically reduced the craving of the rat, which is measured by the times it presses the lever. But what's more interesting, even though we, don't, we didn't treat the rat any further, at day 60, the rat was still not addicted because we have removed some underlying genomic uh, epigenetic marks that essentially eliminated the cause uh, of the behavior. And lastly, I want to talk about aging, which fits very nicely into this uh, understanding. Aging is a process that involves timed epigenetic reprogramming. The biological clock is affected by life history. So we all have a clock, 
And that clock appears to be connected with DNA methylation. So we have certain genes, when you're born, they have zero methylation. And when one dies, they have 100% methylation. And if you're 100 years old, it probably will move at the rate of one a few percent a year. But in some people, the biological clock moves fast. And in other people, it moves slow. So the big question now in the field is, could personal intervention to slow down the DNA methylation clock and biological aging uh, shift uh, aging? Animal evidence shows that personalized intervention could slow down the DNA methylation clock and biological aging. And sometimes we can even double the life of an animal by epigenetic interventions. Preliminary human clinical data shows that DNA methylation clock could be reversed in humans as well. So how do we translate this information in order to take control of our lives, which is the great question that we are asking. Now that we understand how critical is our lifestyle and what we're doing uh, for moving our life, including our methylation clock. So essentially, epi a field of epi-aging is trying to harness the power of epigenome for epi healthy aging by using this methylation as kind of a clock that tells us where we are in, in this life trajectory. And this is just an example of how DNA methylation correlates with biological age. So this is the results of a clock in a few 700 people. And what you see here, each person here uh, has a, a level of, bio, of epigenetic clock, a DNA methylation clock that fits its chronological age. But most of the people are somewhere along the line. But you see for this person, he's 60 year old, but his biological clock is around 90. This person is 40 years old, is 62 years old, but his methylation clock is 40. So even though most people move something around the 82 year old lifespan, some have better clocks, faster clocks than others. So the big question in the field is, can we use this to help us to guide our life? So could lifestyle changes, exercise, dietary habits uh, that have been recommended for some time, could they actually affect the clock? And we need more data about the most advisable changes that they should, and they should be personalized because what we understand about experience, not one experience fits all. So how do we know which lifestyles uh, are advisable uh, and how, how, can we, uh, how can we learn? And I believe that it will be almost impossible to do a clinical trial that takes into account all these different matrices. And perhaps we can use another revolution that is happening in our lifetime, which is the technological revolution by which people could share those information uh, using app technologies uh, to, uh, to uh, derive. We all do experiments. Every day we do experiments with our life, but what, how do they pan out? Can we share what we did? Can we share what happened to us? Can we use DNA methylation clocks as some sort of an outcome that can tell us which combination uh, of uh, experiences are useful or not? So I'll leave you with this, uh, with this uh, figure. Uh, the idea is that perhaps we are able to change our DNA methylation uh, clock by nutrition and lifestyle changes, but we just don't know exactly how to do it. And perhaps we can learn from each other uh, by sharing and using uh, technology, in this case, uh, uh, internet and, and, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence technology to analyze, collect the data, and improve the way by reinforced learning uh, that we can shift our clock a little bit and have a healthier and, and longer life. Of course, that's a dream. But finally, we have some mechanistics uh, of, of understanding how this dream might be possible one day. And I will conclude here. And I thank you very much for your attention, uh, for being with us uh, today, even though it's on Zoom. And I think I'll be open the uh, lecture for questions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Schiff, for this most fascinating talk. We will now move on to the discussion period, which will be moderated by NTL pageant, Mura's president-elect and professor emeritus in the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics. Andy. Thank you very much, uh, Moshe. This was, uh, as always, a very fascinating, thought-provoking uh, presentation of something that really is growing by the bounds. And I must say, you are one of these leaders that uh, it's always fun to see what's coming around the corner. And aging is one thing that is uh, more and more interested, uh, interesting to Mura members right. who belong to that distinguished group of 
people that actually have to fulfill their lives when they stop working, presumably. All right, so I'm, all I could say, I'm inviting our uh, listeners to pose the questions in the, on the, at the bottom of your screen, you have Q&A uh, button. You click on it and you put your question in. And if you are, while you are still thinking, uh, let me ask one question that is um, always uh, uh, intriguing in, in this context of epigenetics. And this is one that epigenetic markers are actually uh, propagating in generations. Now, how far could they go? We have these few examples uh, that you have mentioned, one recent, and I'll study it with the hunger in the Netherlands at the end mm -hmm. of the Second World War, mm -hmm. how far this markers stay and modify uh, people's lives? So, you know, as you know, this is still the controversial. Am I muted or can you hear me? I could hear you and ah, so good, good. the others should be able to hear you. Right. So this is an extremely controversial field because we believe that, you know, each generation is a carte blanche and uh, comes out uh, free from all the uh, uh, of the inheritance of uh, experience of the past, that this is probably not true. And in animals, the evidence is very strong that we can get multiple generations many generations, especially in, in lower animals like uh, nematodes or certain flies. Um, but in, uh, in uh, higher animals, uh, there are many studies that are, shown, are showing fourth and fifth generation by now. And I think evolution has done this in a way that is uh, very useful for fitness. And so it's not just uh, random accidents that are happening. So certain information should be passed through future generations and others are, are, are redundant and useless. So somehow evolution has achieved the balance of uh, you know, the kind of uh, experiences that are worthwhile preserving and those that are not. And obviously for this system to be useful, it should be erased when that information is not needed anymore. And so uh, there's going to be a balance of, uh, of inheritance and erasure and, uh, and it will be fascinating to figure out how evolution uh, figured out the good formula for the balance of these two processes. And um, however, you know, evolution is imperfect. And because of that imperfection, uh, sometimes these uh, latent experiences can cause trouble. And uh, this is what we learned from the Dutch famine study. We know that certain PTSD situations, stressful situation could be inherited not through genes, but through experience. And, um, and so the question is how much of it is useful and how much of it is detrimental. I happen to believe, and that's only a philosophical belief and not a scientific one, that uh, even disease is, teach is, is, is an adaptive process that somehow is uh, in the wrong context. So um, in, in its basis, it's, it's an, an adaptive process. And, and this balance is, is very, very critical for us to understand. And of course, highly complicated. Well, uh, speaking of this, you, yes, you're right. In fact, uh, one of the very uh, growing branch of medicine is so-called evolutionary medicine, right. which looks, uh, we normally see patients and see the proximal causes of whatever trouble he, she came to us. But in fact, there's always something that's called evolutionary tale or very good past. Right. And this is where probably epigenetics is uh, very important. And it's interesting that sometimes looking at the evolutionary side of the uh, medical case, uh, we may have to, we have to change the approach, therapeutic approach. For example, right. infections cause a loss of iron. And the first, in, in, uh, first uh, kind of impulse is let's put this iron back. Well, bacteria like iron, and this is a fence. Well, I'm uh, waiting for somebody to say better question than me. I there are could, many uh, questions, uh, Ante, on the sorry? chat. There are many questions on the chat. You just yes, hit uh, the Q&A. Yeah. Q &A. Yeah, 16 okay, questions. Good. So yeah. let me start. Two questions uh, from Claude Lalande. 
is there any relevance of classical separated twin studies in understanding epigenetics? Yes, indeed, this is a great question. And of course, uh, twin studies have starred in epigenetics because uh, seemingly it allows us to differentiate between genes and environment. And indeed, um, very early on, uh, in early 2000s, uh, Esteller has uh, compared twins and showed that even identical twins uh, evolve many, many epigenetic changes later in life, because even identical twins are going to have a very different life uh, course. And now many diseases that are discordant in identical twins are traced to epigenetic changes from Alzheimer to asthma and others. So this is, of course, an exciting field. But however, we learned that even identical twins are not so identical even genetically. And so uh, there are some de novo changes uh, in genetics. But of course, this is, a, this is a beautiful system to dissect it. It serves a very important role in epigenetics and especially in geno epigenomics and in mapping um, uh, uh, changes in genetics that cause epigenetic changes versus changes that are epigenetic. And I, and I need to mention here is that a lot of genetic changes cause are in epigenetic hotspots. So the way they manifest themselves is through, is through epigenetics. And that is very important because that explains gene by environment interactions, which is two people can inherit a bad gene, but you'll see the disease only in one person. And that is because the, this, is, this is only will manifest itself once the epigenetic change will happen. So the genetic change predisposes an epigenetic change that will only happen with a certain environment. And that's how uh, two, two people can inherit the same genes, but one will develop a disorder and one will not. Here's a follow-up question. Is there a, a different strength of epigenetic patterns if established in early age versus later oh, in life? Of course. And uh, um, of course, 99% of epigenetics, uh, I might be wrong because, uh, but a vast majority of epigenetic changes happen through early embryogenesis. Of course, there's development after birth. We know that yeah, the brain keeps developing after birth and other tissues keep developing. And there is puberty, which is another big driver of, um, of epigenetic changes. Uh, and indeed the, the behavioral difference between males and females is driven probably to a large extent by epigenetic changes driven by hormones and, and, and et cetera. So there are multiple times in life where big epigenetic changes happen. Menopause is a big one. So, uh, you know, I just stumbled across this because I was looking at the DNA methylation patterns of breast cancer patients. And we saw this huge difference, which didn't make sense. And then I looked at the ages and there was premenopause and postmenopause had nothing to do with breast cancer. And, um, and so that's a big time. And I'm sure in, you, in males, there's also some for, sort of a form of menopause. And of course, aging causes huge changes in DNA methylation. And not just the normal aging, but what we call aging is when a person gets old and there are dramatic changes in epigenetics. And actually uh, animal experiments suggest that you can uh, reverse at least aging in animals by uh, by supplementing the animal with DNA methyl transferase 3A. You can make the animal smarter and younger. And so, um, so there are critical periods. And I think that- um, That is the next question. No, which is the next question. Okay, so <laughs> yes, let's- uh, How do critical periods fit into this story? Yes. So, um, so of course we have the story of embry embryonal epigenetic pattern evolution is a very timed process. So, um, you know, change number two has to happen after change number one, which happens after change zero. So it's a movie. And if you, uh, you know, you move the script very early on, the whole movie is going to change. So of course, a script that happens in the beginning of the movie will have a much larger impact on how the story evolves than a script that happens later. Happens later. And this is what makes it really difficult to change things when you're old or when, when the system has been closed down, because now you have uh, millions or billions of changes that have to be reversed in a certain order backwards. And although it's not theoretically impossible, it's probably practically impossible. And that's why if the changes happen early, uh, they could be more meaningful and also uh, more potent than changes that happen late. Thank you. Now, here's a, a question from uh, John David Stewart. 
uh, relation of telomerase and methylation in aging. Right. So, of course, um, you know, a, a, a fantastic uh, marker of aging is, is the length of telomeres, which protect our DNA and get shorter. And uh, the belief is that once they can't protect our DNA anymore, um, uh, we senesce and die. And, um, and uh, they're not absolutely correlated, but they are correlated. However, it is uh, known now by many studies that DNA methylation is a much better predictor of age than, than telomeres. So telomeres will probably differentiate between uh, time zones in aging, but not between a year uh, by year as methylation does. Uh, the uh, DNA methylation clocks really ticks in a very amazing way. And actually when you take the methylation levels in percentage and age, it's almost a linear correlation. And so, which, which is remarkable, I still don't understand uh, how it works. Uh, we don't understand the mechanism, uh, but uh, it probably has to do with, with uh, the enzymes that methylate, like dnm 3 T3A, which appears to be really important in, in aging. And so that enzyme has, might, might have some inbuilt head uh, stochasticity uh, that, uh, and, and some you know, gradual decline. dnm 3 a itself gets methylated as we age. Uh, so you, you, have, um, you have kind of a predictable, highly predictable, by the way, which is interesting. You know, like you've never seen a mouse that is 80 year old, right? And it's very rare to see a human that dies at two, like a mouse. And so it seems that the methylation clock is moving much faster in a mouse than in a human. So it's highly predictable by evolution. So we are born with a clock that has a certain rate. And actually that's what probably makes the difference why certain organisms live a hundred years or 400 years and others live a day. And, uh, and uh, so that clock is ticking at different rates. And so it's probably very wired into our system, but we still don't understand the complete mechanism of this. Uh, thank you. Now, next question is from an anonymous attendee who is questioning the following. His question is, as more fathers take on uh, the child rearing as the primary child caregiver in society, would we see the same DNA methylation changes as you have with mother? This is a fascinating question. So by the way, I'm asked quite a lot on this, um, especially this time and age where we're thinking about equity and degenderization de de of things. But, you know, so here's a balance between biological evolution of mammals and mammals are attached to mammary glands. That's why we call them mammals. And the evolution of the brain that creates new ideas that were not ingrained in evolution of paternal role. So we are definitely not a monogamous animal, neither are we a paternal animal. Um, the control of children in, in may, human evolution was initially all given to, to the mammary gland carrier, which is the female. And uh, so most of our models come from there. Now the big question, this is a philosophical question. I'm not going to go deep into this because I don't want to get into trouble. But the question is how much respect you give to biology or to evolution and how much can we change evolution? And you raise a really interesting thing. You say, perhaps as our brain comes up with the idea that fathers also should take care of their children, uh, epigenetics is flexible enough. It's not bound uh, you know, by these strict chains of genetics, so that it will be possible uh, to, um, to change epigenetically males in such a way that they will start having the same uh, kind of behaviors that females have. And indeed, there are animal experiments that suggest that males also develop some of these, uh, you know, uh, parental kind of, and we all know that it's true, parental uh, changes when we have children. Uh, oxytocin is, is suggested to be, you know, one of the hormones that is involved in it. And more people are starting to ask this question, which, which ties into really fundamental questions and in, in, in how much respect we give to, so, uh, to our biological tradition and how much we can play with it uh, to move, uh, to move uh, uh, forward. But we have one example from animals. We can alter actually the gender of a mouse or the behavioral features of a gender of a mouse using a DNA methylation inhibitor. 
So we can turn a female mouse to a male with a DNA methylation inhibitor, and it starts behaving like a male. It stays a female, but behaves like a male. And, and that is totally epigenetic. So there's something in, in, in that, and who, who knows? Maybe those changes in human behavior and attitudes will cause persistent and, and fixed epigenetic changes. Interesting. Here's another question that is very much in line with what's going on outside of this Zoom. And that is, do you believe the ongoing pandemic will have serious epigenetic effects in the future? I think already there is data coming up. And a lot of people are asking this question very much faster than I, I wanted to do it. But a lot of it was done by others and showing DNA methylation changes first that predict who will be who will have severe you know, uh, responses and, and also show that, of course, there are going to be epigenetic changes. Question is how widespread they're going to be, uh, how big they are going to be. Are they going to adapt us to this situation? Uh, I believe that even you know, changing your life from uh, meeting people who smell and, and you breathe to a piece of glass as we're doing now uh, will have epigenetic consequences because um, we have to adjust our brain to, to this way of life. We also see some people do it better than others. And, um, and so, you know, a lot of it has to do with the epigenetic unlock that it came to, to this pandemic with and, and, and that they will come out of the pandemic with. And I think it will be a fascinating story. So we have other questions, which is like the ice storm, you know, it will the stress of epigenetics affect, you know, uh, those who never suffered from the coronavirus uh, before I was talking with those who actually were infected, but what about those who were not infected, like most of us, but suffered through all the consequences of, of this uh, pandemic? And of course, some of us suffered more than others. Some of us continued the regular work, Other, otherwise were locked in their homes. Uh, you know, some of us were exposed to more danger than others. So I think there's a lot of research projects that will come up, and I have no doubt that we will get interesting questions including what will happen with the next generation, the children that were born during this time, but also, uh, you know, what does it do to our germline? And does it change the methylation of our ovaries and sperm and so on and so forth? Yeah. Fascinating. Oh, here's a question related to your mention of technology. Are there any current trials of information sharing apps such as you described? Of course, I mean, this is exactly what, App, what Apple does with a watch that you buy from uh, them. And, um, and so Google and Apple and probably Amazon are already experimenting with this. And, um, and, and this is where they're going with this uh, e-health um, idea. So a lot of people, we are trying to play with this. It's a very difficult area. It has a lot of ethical issues, a lot of issues of privacy, a lot of issues of how to share without sharing uh, you know, uh, private issues. And so, you know, I think uh, it will require a lot of uh, problem solution, but in my opinion, the best clinical trial is the one we're doing every day. And the main problem with clinical trials is because we as scientists are reductionists. So we try to have a clinical trial where everything else is controlled and we're looking for one thing, but humans are not one thing. And so all clinical trials are really fake because they examine a situation that is artifactual. And therefore, what happens is that many times we have a, a drug that was aced in the clinical trial, even you know, 100,000, a million people, it doesn't make difference in number because it was all controlled. Now you send it to the wild and people do other things that you didn't control. And, and, and you get, start getting things happening. And it's probably true for anything that, uh, that went through clinical trial. And so, Clinical trials are very expensive. Uh, and uh, we do so many clinical trials every day with our lives. If we could share it in a, in a, in a scientific way that could be analyzed, uh, uh, we, could, we could make a big change. But I think this is exactly where, where the big high tech are going, but also smaller companies are trying to, uh, to go there. Yeah, measuring our environment. Okay, next question is from Daniel Peruz. Is it possible to obtain a PDF of the presentation and perhaps a copy of the meeting video? Uh, I think Jeanette should answer that, right? Well, we could put it on web website. I think she said that it would be. Yeah. Could be, yes, very good. Okay, now next examiner is uh, Kent Weaver. Do you have examples of shared technologies currently being used? 
and under whose auspices? Okay, so I, I mentioned that, you know, essentially a lot, when you buy a phone now, it has a health app in it. And, uh, and it measures different things like your blood pressure and other things. And a lot of these apps are also change, sending data back if you uh, approve it. And so uh, a lot of it is done probably, you know, semi-legal or fully legal way. So a lot of companies are playing with this. I myself, uh, we developed an app like this for uh, monitoring changes in aging. And uh, we didn't get yet good responses, but still working on the app. But the way I see it is that eventually it will be like Waze, which is the reason why we enter information into Waze is because we get out information out of Waze. And so sharing information rather than selling it to insurance companies and, uh, and others uh, will be the way. But of course, uh, there will be criminals who will try to, you know, abuse it, take hold and abuse it. So this is going to be a very active field. Um, you know, blockchain technology starts to tries to protect certain of this, but extremely important and interesting field that will have a huge impact on medicine. Uh, Atar Bakus, uh, thank you for the excellent talk. Can you speculate on new structure we might look toward in early childhood education? I think um, it's a very good question. Uh, a very good question. So one of the things we learned um, is that there is no one education that fits all. And uh, for example, the, uh, the stressed animals, the low end, the low maternal care animals will thrive in a stressful environment, will fail in a non-stressful <laughs> environment and vice versa. So we have created a education system that fits the middle class. So it is excellent if you're just at the middle, uh, but if you if you have no patients, um, that system will not work for you. Uh, if you're highly anxious, it won't work for you. And so, the big challenge is to have a personalized way of education that it looks into the epigenetic constituency of the child, and uh, and and adapts it to the. Um, to, and adapts the education to it. Some, some, some children learn under stress, some don't. Some children flourish on online learning and others fail. And, and there is no one solution because of this enormous diversity that is rooted in early childhood. Thank you. Now, the next question is, and we are actually having more questions than time. <laughs> So I think there is a need for another session of questions, but we don't have it today. So let me um, finish by uh, asking, I think we have two more questions that we could ask. Uh, one quick question, can you reverse the impact of trauma? The impact of? Trauma. Right, so this is something I'm really interested in. And we have actually a paper that is now in preparation where we show that uh, we can treat, um, again, a rat model uh, with a combination of uh, epigenetic modifiers uh, to reverse trauma. And, um, and so in, the, in this study, you know, animals are exposed to certain trauma and like humans after three or four weeks, they still, when they encounter a reminder of the trauma, uh, they, they evoke uh, the freezing and, and the uh, hyper, uh, vigilance and other uh, phenotypes of, of, the, um, uh, of the trauma. And this, these could be reversed. And we have mapped the epigenetic changes of trauma, others have, but in this case, in this animal, and uh, some of them are reversed uh, by the epigenetic uh, treatment. And what's interesting also about trauma is resilience, right? You all know that not every soldier who goes to a battle will end with PTSD. Actually, it's a minority. And, uh, small minority that will end up with PTSD. But they were in the same battle. They encountered the same uh, shots and the same problems, and they saw the same blood. And why is one person developing PTSD and another not? With animals, it's exactly the same. When you expose animals, let's say rats, the trauma for a rat is a cat. If you expose a rat to a cat, uh, they will develop PTSD, but not all animals around 70 to 20, 17 to 20 percent of animals will develop PTSD and others will not. So we found that there are epigenetic differences that probably cause resilience as well. So, um, so there is a stochastic epigenetic response. In some animals, it will create resilience. In others, it will create susceptibility. And perhaps evolution wanted it this way. PTSD might be a useful phenotype in a group. 
and, and you want to balance those who have a hyper anxious response to trauma and others that don't. Because, you know, when, when there is a threat to a society, some people sense are the sensors that tell us that there's a threat and others are relaxed and we need a balance of those. So maybe the 17, 20% of PTSD is part of an evolutionary um, a fitness of a group rather of individuals. Yeah. Well, uh, this was an outstanding lecture and there are so many interesting questions that unfortunately we have to uh, close the question and answer uh, period. Uh, first by thanking all the public and in particular thanking our Moshe Schiff. I didn't read all the uh, uh, thank you notes about your clear presentation and very important thing that uh, explains many people's lives. So thank you very much uh, Professor Schiff and we hope to see soon some of this announced uh, technological and ideological changes our uh, understanding of epigenetics role in our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. I pass you. the word to Jeanette. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schiff, very much for this fascinating talk and, 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 the, and all of the uh, elaborate answers. And thank you, Auntie, for moderating uh, the question period. Of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Mushi Schiff's uh, talk will be uh, will be distributed to the participants um, after uh, after this uh, this talk. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, now I will um, I will invite uh, Brian Harvey, President of Curac, to introduce the video of the Curac Awards presentation. Ryan. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Nura for permitting uh, CURAC to present these awards today. CURAC tribute awards are made to recognize exceptional contributions and or achievements of retirees in their host institutions or to the community at large. They are normally presented at our annual banquet. However, as previously indicated, we were unable to hold the conference for the last two years and thus the associated banquets. It is important for us, of course, to recognize the outstanding contribution of these awardees. And so we're just delighted to be able to do this virtually. I'll read off, before we go to the presentation, uh, I'll read off the names of those who are to be awarded uh, the tribute awards today. Jay Goldstein from the University of Manitoba Retirees Association. John Lennox from the York University Retiree Association. Ken Craig, University of British Columbia Emeriti Association. Gary Kribbe, Emeriti Association of the University of Calgary. Kathleen, better known as Kate McGuire from McGill University Retiree Association. Ron Cosper, St. Mary's University Retiree Association. Kent Weaver, Retiree Community of the University of Toronto Faculty Association. Kent, by the way, is also a board member of Arohi. Uh, Randy Barkhouse, Association of Dalhousie Retirees and Pensioners. Congratulations uh, to all and a thank, big, big thank you uh, for your service. Uh, there follows a compilation of videos uh, honoring not all of the uh, awardees, but some of them. And I want to acknowledge the work of Kent Percival, uh, CURAC Vice President, in uh, quarterbacking putting this together. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to nominate uh, Ron Cosper for the CURAC Tribute Award for 2021. Uh, Ron has been a, um, a member of, of the organization SMURA, the St. Mary's University Retired Rees Association, since its founding in 2005. And he served on, on the, the board for all of that time and in uh, and committee uh, memberships and also as president for a total of nine years uh, during that time. Uh, Ron has been a constant supporter, uh, advocate for the National Curac uh, organization, 
Um, he was involved in, in a number of CURAC activities. He attended the national conference uh, several times over those years, and, and he was on a number of, of committees. Thank you so much, Keith, and uh, it's a great pleasure to, to receive this award. And uh, it is especially important, as you indicate, because of the value that CUREC has been to our own organization at St. Mary's. Uh, it's been a difficult year, as, as we all know, and uh, difficult for those in the uh, central organization as, as well as here. But uh, thanks to our board and uh, officers, uh, Keith as president, we've been able to continue on and maintain ourselves anyway in a holding pattern until we're able to do a little more. But uh, as I see it, uh, our morale is very high in our organization. Everyone is pleased, uh, for example, with the uh, uh, services that CUREC has provided for us uh, in the area, for example, of, uh, of travel insurance and health insurance, uh, which we badly needed. We were underserved at St. Mary's in the past, and uh, we're just uh, so pleased to uh, be cooperating with, with CUREC on, on this. Um, I, I guess that's enough to, to say, uh, except for that, uh, I, you know, I wouldn't have, have been able to do anything without the help of our officers and members. And uh, we're just looking forward so much to, to getting into full gear again as soon as uh, this emergency is, is finished. Uh, uh, so thank you again. Uh, to to Keith and uh, Kent and to to Kirak for for uh, their kindness uh, in presenting this award. Hello, everyone. My name is Bob Stanley, and I'm the treasurer of the McGill University Retiree Association. It is my great pleasure today to present a CURAC award to Kate McGuire on behalf of both the CURAC board and the MURA executive committee. Kate has been MURA's vice president internal for the last five years. She has presided over an unprecedented period of growth of our association in which she has not only organized and coordinated all of our events, but she has developed and continues to administer our webpage and continues to develop and keep up to date a database of member activities. She has done this with energy, creativity, and good humor. She is a consummate volunteer and a tremendous asset to Mira. So on behalf of everybody, thank you, Kate, and congratulations. Thank you, Bob. And I'm very grateful to the Mira executive for the nomination and to CURAC for this tribute award. For 25 years, I worked with a fantastic group of people at the Days Hotel Faculty of Management, and Mira offers invaluable opportunities to reconnect with my colleagues and meet new ones here and across Canada. I'm so glad that I was able to use computer skills that I learned at McGill to help Mira grow and transfer many of its activities and events to a virtual platform during the pandemic. Of course, this growth would not have been possible without the support of my very dedicated Mira board colleagues, the enthusiastic participation of our members, McGill's administration, academic and staff associations and unions, and of course, my husband, Sean Devlin, who said my involvement with Mira will keep me young. I'm very delighted to be a part of an association that has a goal of integrating retirees into the McGill community and offers a wealth of social, physical, and intellectual opportunities for its members. Congratulations, Kent, on being awarded a CURAC Tribute Award for 2021. Here is a lovely frame certificate from CURAC to hang on your office wall. I'm going to read a selection from my citation. It is a pleasure to nominate my esteemed colleague, Kent Weaver, 
for the 2021 Curac Tribute Award. Kent is a dynamic force in the retiree community at the University of Toronto Faculty Association, or UTFA as we call it. Kent served as an outstanding first chair of UTFA's Retired Members Committee from 2015 to 2018, establishing this committee as a central one to represent the salary and benefits and pension plan needs of retired faculty and librarians at the Uni U University of Toronto. While chair of the Retired Members Committee, Kent also served on the UTFA executive, where he ensured that retiree concerns were raised and addressed. In addition, since his retirement in 2013, Kent has served on many UTFA committees, including being UTFA's Chief Returning Officer, Speaker of the Council, Chair of the Nominating Committee, and Retiree Representative on UTFA's, UTFA's Bargaining Committee team. Kent is an enthusiastic participant in Curac's annual conference and inspired five colleagues to attend in 2019, including me. Kent also served on the Senior College Board of Management at U of T and serves on a Rohe's Board of Directors. In summary, Kent is a stellar candidate for Curac's Tribute Award. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the late John Monroe, Professor Emeritus of Economics. For several years prior to 2013, John assiduously encouraged me to join our then Academic Retiree Association, Rollet. I want to thank Jody for her leadership and all of my colleagues on the Retired Members Committee for their support in putting my nomination forward. I suspect all of us have our own definition of academic retirement and what it may look like in the years to come. I am grateful that in CURAC we have a national body where we can come together to share and learn from one another. Please let me conclude by congratulating all of my fellow award winners. John Lennox has been nominated for a CURAC ARUCC Tribute Award by the York University Retirees Association for his exceptional contribution to the association. After a distinguished career as professor and senior administrator at York University, John Lennox retired in 2010 and immediately became involved in the work of the York University Retirees Association. John was co-president from 2011 to 2017 and has served as past president ex officio from 2017 to present. At the organization level, John has worked diligently to build a strong bridge between the York University Retirees Association and York's other th uh, retiree association, the Association of Retired Faculty and li Librarians. So over to you, Charmaine, to present the certificate. So I'm gonna hold it up for everybody to see. John, it is my honor to follow in your footsteps and to present you with this well-deserved tribute um, for all that you've done for us uh, at York University, not just Europe, but all of the universities. So congratulations. I, I uh, would like, first of all, to uh, let Curac and the Euro executive know how tremendously honored by, I am by this award. <clears throat> Uh, Yura has meant a great deal to me, and I've worked with some wonderful people. And uh, it's the work of a collective, it's a collaborative kind of unit, and uh, I accept this as um, uh, very, uh, very uh, um, humbly, because I think we all work together to make this work. I would like particularly to mention uh, five people, all women with whom I've had the great pleasure of working uh, at Eura. The first two were the dynamic duo of Sandra Pike and uh, Nancy Accinelli. Several years before my retirement, I used to see Nancy in the halls and her byword to me always used to be, John Lennox, I've got my eye on you. And when she, very tragically died much too early. Sandra ably took over the uh, 
the presidency of Eura, and I think with Nancy's spirit in mind, reached out to me. And with those two women, you never said no, ever. So Sandra asked if I'd be president, co-president, and I said, yes, I will run. So I didn't have to take any time. I just knew that their hands had been laid on me, so I, I had no choice in the matter. The other three women are my co-presidents, -pre co Janet Rowe, Jane Crescenzi, and Charmaine Curtis, uh, a terrific trio of very hardworking, interesting women whose first concern was the well-being of the association above everything and the health of the relationship of the association to the university coming a close second. I'm particularly proud of the fact that through our scholarship program, which has grown uh, in its uh, monetary value year over year, Eura has continued to play a dynamic part in the ongoing work of the university and continues to do so. That, I think, is our, uh, our signal and our characteristic achievement, and I hope it never grows less because the students we support keep telling us what a difference uh, the uh, Eura Scholarship has made. So my association with the, with the association has been nothing but uh, a pleasure to me, matched by a very constructive kind of partnership with the university in working together to help the young students at York. And for people who are beyond retirement, this sense of continuity is beyond gratifying. So I want to thank you, Ian, and uh, you, Charmaine, for the part you played in this. And just to let you know very sincerely and to let the, your executive know and CURAC to know that this award means a very great deal to me, and I am tremendously grateful for the honor. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, present you uh, with an award from CURAC, and I'd like to read the citation. It is a tribute award and it states that Jay Goldstein retired from the Department of Sociology, University of Manitoba in June of 2002 and became a member of the retiree committee at the University of Manitoba from 2003 to 2004. <laughs> Jay's work on University of Manitoba Retirees Association, abbreviated AMRA committees, has been extensive. He drafted the constitution, bylaws that were adopted at the first annual general meeting of the established AMRA in 2003. Jay then served as chair of the Publicity Committee for the inaugural CURAC National Conference, co-sponsored by AMRA and University of Winnipeg Retirees Association, held in Winnipeg in 2004. From 2005 to 2009, Jay served as vice president of AMRA, followed immediately as its president from 2009 to 2013. Since 2013, Jay has served as past president of AMRA and chaired the nominating committee from 2013. And continuing to date, Jay serves on the membership committee of AMRA, maintains its database, and participates in a revision of applicable forms. Jay also provides AMRA with ongoing statistical information that we require for various reports. And from 2016 and continuing to date, Jay serves as co-chair of the Executive Committee's Retirement Planning Subcommittee, which has been instrumental in having the university implement a number of the committee's recommendations regarding retirement planning. Jay continues to serve as a member at large of the UMRA Executive Committee, is our expert on historical evolution of UMRA, and mentors those of us who have subsequently agreed to serve on its Executive Committee. And uh, for all of these reasons, uh, Kamra has agreed that you deserve the Tribute Award, Jay. It's my pleasure to offer it to you today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it, in its 18 years of existence, Umra has, I think, become a very effective representative of the interests of all the retirees of the university. I'm glad to have been able to uh, play a part in this, and I'd like to thank the Umra executive for nominating me for the Tribute Award. And
Kenneth D. Craig is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of British Columbia. Since retirement in 2003, Ken has been actively involved in the development of Canadian academic retiree associate organizations. Congratulations, Ken. I'm going to hand over to Graham. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, Don, of course, is my predecessor as principal of the UBC Emeritus College, and I'm delighted that he is able to read the citation for Ken, as he was instrumental in moving this forward. A richly deserved award, and we are delighted, uh, Ken, on behalf of the Emeritus College and all of your colleagues throughout the university in Vancouver and in the larger academic and psychology communities uh, in North America and beyond. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be involved as principal of UBC Emeritus College in helping the presentation of this award. And so I would like at this juncture to present you with the award, the Cure Act Tribute Award, Ken, very richly deserved our hearty congratulations and over to you. Strain was developed by gastroenterologists. Well, thank you, Graham. And through the magic of uh, virtual reality and the cyberspace, uh, I have it in front of me, and it is indeed a wonderful honor, uh, which I will cherish for a very long time. Uh, I become involved in organizations not so much for uh, the honors that go with them, but for the opportunities to. Uh, have uh, collegial opportunities and, and and to spend time with people like you, Don and and uh, Graham, uh, people whom I've known but for what seems like a lifetime, but with whom I've not had much of an opportunity to spend time. And the the Association of Professors of Maritime at UBC and now the Emeritus College, which is a wonderful development, uh, are, uh, are they are affording the opportunity opportunity to uh, develop friendships. And indeed, I do feel like I've um, developed a number of friendships uh, uh, since retirement with uh, uh, lovely uh, people whom I've met through uh, the UBC Emeritus organizations and also through uh, CURAC. CURAC has been a window on uh, retired academics across Canada, and I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, the developing relationships with uh, 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 people uh, across uh, Canada. Uh, you mentioned some accomplishments. I have to say that uh, my contributions to those developments were meager relative to the activities of uh, others and I, I thank them for uh, sharing this award with me. So thanks, gang. Congratulations to all the CURAC winners. It's wonderful to see the many contributions that these volunteers have made to their associations. It is time to conclude this event. This has been a most enriching experience. My deepest thanks to our speakers and to you, our participants, for making this a most illuminating event. Modern medicine has been salutary to steer us out of the pandemic and will continue to lead the way to create a safe and secure world. Thank you to our American friends for joining us today. Many thanks to our Mura members for their participation and to our colleagues from coast to coast across Canada. Mes remerciements les plus sincères aux retraités des universités du Québec et de la francophonie canadienne. This event would not have been possible without the dedication of Mura's local organizing committee, the thoughtful guidance of CURAC's conference chair, the technical expertise of Bruce Lawler's team at CCR Solutions, the outstanding skills of our VP internal, Kate McGuire, and of course, our generous sponsors. 
Colette Travel Tours, Economical Insurance, Johnson Travel Insurance, Retired Teachers of Ontario, and Trip Merchant. My very best to you all. See you soon, I hope. Au revoir, à la prochaine.